morning, everyone. So it seems like it's been, and it has been, many months since we talked about the Holy Land. So I'll back up just a little bit. We had talked about um, the beginning of the life of Christ, about his nativity, about when he became an adult, when he was baptized, his temptation in the desert. And then he went back to uh, his native land, which was in Nazareth, and then also to Galilee. So I introduced his life in Galilee because if we look here, um, Galilee is around the Sea of Galilee. Nazareth here is technically in the greater region of Galilee, but it's a ways away. And so this is where he had his childhood and upbringing. But then as soon as he began his public ministry, the people in Nazareth tried to throw him off a precipice, if you recall. And that's where we ended before. And so now he has moved to Capernaum, which is on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee here. Right here are some of these old cities, Kavda and Chorazin and Bethsaida. And um, when he moved to Capernaum, this was uh, recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, it says, this is right after he had the, the uh, temp three temptations by the devil. Now when Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled what was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light upon those who sat in the region in shadow of death, light has dawned. From this time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So this is the beginning of his, what we would call his public ministry. He was baptized, but he didn't begin going out and preaching to the people until he came to Galilee. So something to just think about geographically. This is all uh, modern-day Israel and all much of the land of the ancient Israelites. Okay, And the center of that is in Jerusalem. And especially after the, cap the uh, captivity in Babylon and coming back and building the second temple, this becomes the heart of Judaism. And so all of the, the uh, major Jewish thinkers, all of the different sects, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, are based here in Jerusalem. And so Jesus, interestingly, he went basically to the backwater of the land of the Jewish people, to the far edges, way up at the Sea of Galilee. And that's where he began his ministry, among the simple people, not among all the highly ranked people, the people who were in with the Roman leaders, but rather in Galilee. So um, Jesus then, immediately after, he calls his disciples. And um, so an interesting thing about Capernaum, to give you a sense of how um, how many miracles were performed in this little region of Capernaum, Bethsaida, all along the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 11, after he's performed so many different miracles, this is what he says. He actually curses Capernaum, saying, as well as Bethsaida and Chorazin. He says, then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, why is it exalted to heaven? because it had God himself there and performing miracles time and time again. We'll be brought down to Hades, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you, it will, shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Very strong words. And very soon after Christ's life, these cities just 
went into oblivion. They've just been ruins for centuries, many centuries. So these are not active towns at all, these, uh, these particular biblical cities. So then he calls his disciples in Capernaum. And in the Gospel of Mark is where we hear, we hear this in a number of the Gospels, but right at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the Gospel of the Kingdom of God. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. They were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, as he taught for, as one having authority, not as the scribes. And again, this is, these are not the, uh, the highest of the theologians in Judaism. This is out in this small town where they do have a synagogue, but the scribes who are there would, would likely not be as well-educated as those in Jerusalem. So uh, I did mention this monastery before, but it's been again so many weeks I wanted to go through this again. So this is in Capernaum, the church and monastery of the Holy Apostles. And inside this church, there's the entrance to the church. It has the symbol of the, the patriarch of Jerusalem there, the Aaron Coughlin, and then the entrance to the church. And this church, I'll show you a little video here, is covered, covered with icons, and especially with icons from the life of Christ in Capernaum, from the miracles. So here you are. You don't need any sound with this, it's just to see the icon of the show. And that's the dome with Christ, on the Bravo. And all around the walls, these are all miracles from his time in Capernaum. And then on the other side as well, more miracles. And the calling of the apostles, and then this stunning icon that I'll show you in a bit of the Judgment Day. And there's the second dome, which has the Ancient of Days from the uh, prophet Daniel. Sorry, I know it's a little swirly around, but <laughs> get a sense of the space, because I'll show you photographs of these. So those are the two domes. This is not God the Father. This is the Ancient of Days, which is another icon of Christ, and that's why it says ICXC on the top there. And do domes uh, traditionally have angels as the highest portion of the dome next to Christ, then prophets. And this one has further prophets in these little round icons here. And then it has the four evangelists on these corners of the domes. And that's all a very typical style. It looks like over here, those might be Old Testament prophets that are shown there. I'm not sure. So this is uh, looking forward to the front of the church. You have the apostles here. Again, miracles. This is him breaking bread with them after the resurrection. This is him calling the apostles in the boat after the resurrection. This is him healing the ruler's daughter. Uh, this is him. I think this is when he, I don't remember exactly what, what that one is. I can't see it very clearly, unfortunately. This is when they're in the boats. Christ is sleeping. The storm starts up. They all are fearful and then Christ awakes. You see Christ here again, rebukes the storm. This is a beautiful little icon of Abraham with everyone in the bosom of Abraham. See there? And this is Christ calling Matthew, the, the uh, tax collector. And then this is one of the sides here. So we see a number of the miracles. But again, this was after the resurrection. Peter, seeing that it's Christ, disrobes and jumps into the water and swims after him, and then Christ feeds them. And then this is the back door. So as you're worshiping in the church, 
At the end of the service, you turn around to leave, and this is what you encounter. This is the river of fire. This is judgment. It's the judgment uh, day. These are uh, Abraham, I mean, sorry, uh, Adam and Eve. This is that icon of Abraham in the, the bosom of Abraham. So these are images of paradise. On a year in paradise, there's Abraham's bosom. Who do you think this is? Not Christ. Not Christ. Who else was on the cross? Today you shall be with me in paradise. Yes. And there's the, the uh, cherubim with the flaming sword protecting the door of paradise. So, and then pictures of anguish and torment on this side. Okay, so that was the Church of the Holy Apostles. So there's a little contrast because in Capernaum, half of the property of ancient Capernaum is on the Monastery of the Holy Apostles, and the other half is on the Roman Catholic site. There it is, St. Peter's Home, which is a little bit more of a tourist site, I might say. You come from a monastery, a church, beautiful just um, gardens, right on the Sea of Galilee, and then you go right around the corner and come to this place. So this is where St. Peter's House is in this uh, property that's under the Roman Catholic Church. Now, as soon as they came out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John, but Simon's <clears throat> wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. That was depicted in one of the icons we just saw. So this is a Google uh, aerial to give you a sense. So this is the uh, Monastery of the Holy Apostles. And this here is the Roman Catholic site. So what has happened here is, and again, I will speak with a little bit of judgment because it was uh, a startling experience, the difference between these two. This is a place of prayer, unquestionably. You walk there, it's quiet, it's still. You notice from the, uh, the satellite, these little bumps here, these are all ruins of the ancient town of Capernaum. Why don't we have archeologists out there digging and pulling everything out? We can have all of this. Why? Because it's all depicted right inside the church there. It's not an archeological site, it's a holy site. This here, is all completely dug out, which is very fascinating architecturally, it, it, archeologically. It is fascinating, I have to say that. But it doesn't have the sense of being a holy site. It has a sense of being a historical site. And this is something that our, our guide actually said, because there were a number of sites that were kind of like this when we were around Galilee in the north. He said, this will be the portion of our trip that's the archeological trip, and this will be the portion that's our holy trip down here. because. Down here, another interesting thing, virtually all of the sites are Orthodox sites. They're monasteries, they're churches. Up here, a lot of these sites in the middle of the 1800s were purchased by Protestants and Roman Catholics and dug up and all of that interest that, you know, the historical Jesus thing actually goes back quite far, although we call it something more recent. This idea of we want to dig into the ground and discern exactly what things were like. And so, and the fruit of that is this. So if you see this round thing right here, mm -hmm. it looks like a flying saucer. <laughs> and I kid you not, it, it looks like a flying saucer. <laughs> okay? And this is called the Church of St. Peter's Home. Because this is, these are all the uh, ruins. These are walls from 2,000 years old of the town of Capernaum. And then under here, this church is propped up by these pillars around the edge. So it actually is floating in the air with these pillars around the edge. And then when you look into the center, all the way under the center of that, this is Peter's house. Now you're gonna say, how do we know that? How do we know that? They dug that up in the last 100 years, 200 years. Well, I'll tell you how they know that. Because here's an octagon. These walls right here. <clears throat> And if you go to the Holy Land and you see octagons around, what does that mean? That's an old Byzantine church. So the church that was actually there from the third century 
was built likely by St. Helen or by some very soon after that. That was the typical style of churches in the early Byzantine era was an octagon. And so you see that in a number of places. If you remember many months ago when we talked about the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and that famous building called the Dome of the Rock that has a gold dome, that is of all, that's a Byzant, I mean, a, a, a Islamic site. There's no Islamic architecture, anything like it, because it's an octagon exactly like the Byzantine churches that were there. So not on that particular site, but they copied that architecture for the Dome of the Rock. So octagon, you see this in the historical sites all over the Holy Land, and you're like, okay, that must be the original site. Why? Because that's where they built the church very soon after the time of Christ. Any questions so far? I've been doing a lot of talking. Yeah. So did they build the church around Peter's house? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can see the church was, it was basically a shrine to Peter's home because the, there's no room in here for, I mean, they must have had some tiny altar, but this isn't like a church that a congregation is going and worshiping in. This is a church built on a holy site. Yeah, so those are the walls of the house, which are not octagonal, and then these really clean, straight walls. And actually, I'm sorry, I didn't point this out. These are all the mosaics from that original church, the Byzantine mosaic floors. These panels have been recovered here. Any other questions? Yeah. I just wanted to go back with the church that we looked at before, the icons. They're really beautiful icons, and, uh -huh. um, but they look fresh. So have they been redone? These icons are actually quite recent. Okay, because they're Yeah. Recent. So the, uh, this was a, all of the, the area around Galilee, this was all very rural farm country for many centuries. And it's only in the last about 100 or 200 years where the Patriarch of Jerusalem has had enough means to start building churches again. Again, their, the ancient church was there centuries earlier. Um, and then also Roman Catholic and Protestant uh, groups have purchased. The place that we stayed uh, when we were in this area was a German Catholic group, uh, Pilgrim House, that they had been running for over a hundred years. So, um, so yeah, the churches, even the Orthodox churches in this part of the of the Holy Land, are all usually about within two hundred years old. So, yeah, that's a good question. But the iconography was actually done by the monk who's living there right now. So very recently, and he's a monk that. A wonderful, fascinating um, man. He lived in, I think, Cyprus, and he said, I want to live somewhere where they don't look up to the clergy, where they might spit on them. And so he moved to the Holy Land. <laughs> and that's what you get. And, um, and he's a monk. He's not a priest monk. And he's been there for at least, I think, 30 years, just at this little monastery by himself. Again, very few uh, monastics at these many sites, so it's it's a lonely life, but uh, it's a very holy life as well. Okay, so that's the Church of St. Peter. So there's another thing that was uncovered. Again, it is fascinating that they do the archaeological work. So this is believed to be the synagogue of Capernaum. We don't know, but this was a structure. These, of course, were all tipped down. The walls were tipped down. To these. I, I, I believe this wall actually was original, but all the uh, uh, columns, many of them were tipped down. So that's everything to do with uh, the town of Capernaum. So we moved from there, Christ moved to Capernaum, but then where did he perform his first miracle? Cana of Galilee. So the wedding at Cana of Galilee. This beginning of miracles Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. This comes from the Gospel of John, and very early in the Gospel of John. So um, we hear this in every wedding service. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. The third day, this was right after he had called his disciples. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, a woman, what does that, is that concern between you and me? My hour has not yet come. There's a lot of misunderstanding about that line. Um, using the word woman is not derogatory. 
just to be clear. In English, that's automatically derogatory, but in Aramaic, it was not derogatory, just the way of addressing a person. Um, but you see, Christ is obedient to his mother. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that had been made wine, but did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew it. The master of the feast called the bridegroom. He said, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. And that was the beginning of the miracles. So the church in, uh, is a holy monastery of Cana and Galilee, dedicated to St. George. And this is the entrance to the church, the icon there of the, uh, him turning the water into wine. And this is the inside of the church. Again, completely adorned with iconography. And in this church, they actually have, uh, there's some more images. They actually have two, I believe, of the water pots. So what you see here, these are the original water pots from the wedding in the Cana of Galilee, right here. And what you see around these is these, these are, um, I forgot the word for them, but they're little uh, metal, uh, images and it's a physical way of offering a prayer much like we light a candle with an artifact to offer a prayer to someone people put these there as offering a prayer and sometimes the images on there might be of a saint or an archangel or an image of an infant because the person is is asking for it to be freed of infertility or any number of things or health so you'll see these at any of the holy sites and a place like this they're just lined up everywhere and people putting notes in here. This is actually covered in glass now, so all of those, um, those uh, little metal cards are not, you can't put them on now. So, What's inside it? Nothing. It's a water pot. It, so is that just like the- in, Those were, the these are the pots the for the inside? Juice, what? I mean, from here, it looks like something fuzzy. Is it just like the clay on the Yeah, pot? that's just the coloration. It might have oh, been. okay. This is, I'm sorry. Oops. This is probably more realistic to what we saw. For some reason, the light was shining on that one. Maybe. Yeah. So is there a version of a five-gallon bucket? Yeah, exactly. 20 to 30 gallons. You imagine how heavy that is. Really? 20 to 30 gallons of made of snow. This trip Hard to tell the size. Oh, yeah, so I'm sorry. So these are about like this tall and about this big around. Are they kind of pointed at the bottom? No, no. they're pretty much straight cylinders straight going straight down. Straight cylinders? Yeah. Um, so then that's our group. This is Father Chrysostomos, a very sweet priest monk who was there. And Father Chrysostomos, it happened to be the day that we arrived there, the wine delivery came. <laughs> so they make wine, the Christians in the community make wine, and it's a, a sweet wine that people actually use in weddings. And people bring this home from their trips to the Holy Land. So he had these two massive pallets full of boxes of wine. And I think it was my brother who was like, what do, you, do you need help with these? He said, oh, well, we need to put all of that into here, but it's okay, don't worry about it. And my brother was like, no, let's go ahead and do it. So we ended up making a chain, uh, passing all these boxes of wine. But uh, he's just a very sweet, joyful man. So, and again, he's there by himself. So, there we go. Little live action. He's gonna sit. Uh -huh. <laughs> he tried to get in the line, we said, no, 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 no. So, so that's Cain of Galilee. And in Cana, like in some other holy sites, what's happened is the original site, which is the Orthodox site, where there's always been a church. Then, um, like in this case, there's a Roman Catholic church nearby. That they say this is actually where the wedding in Cana of Galilee happened. Um, and so a lot of times people go to the holy town, and they just, they're just being brought by their guide to whichever site. And they don't necessarily know which one is the actual site, because they're oftentimes 
multiple churches of different uh, denominations. Another thing Father Chrysostomo said is, so in the Holy Land, and I see Mary here also, in, like in Egypt and other places, sometimes the distinction between um, different Christian groups isn't always as clear. And so uh, Father Chrysostomos was talking about how a new Catholic priest came into the church and he was uh, trying to kind of confuse the people like, hey, we're all one, you know, there's that church and this church, we're all one, we're not different, we're the same thing. And Father Chrysostomos told this story, so he would, this Catholic priest kept saying this to the community and really confusing them because then these Orthodox people would be like, oh, I'll just go to church over there. I'll, Father Chrysostomos said something I don't like, I'm going to go to church over at the Catholic church instead. Kind of like what we do here in America, right? Unfortunately. And so uh, Father Chrysostomos was at a gathering once of the clergy, and this uh, Catholic priest said once again, oh, we're all one, we're all one. Father Chrysostomos said, well, that's wonderful that we're all one. So why do we have multiple churches? Let's just all go to the oldest church in Cana together. Everyone can come to the oldest church. And we'll all be one. And the priest didn't say anything after that. So, um, so the next site was the Sermon on the Mount. And this comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5 through 7. I won't read the whole Sermon on the Mount, but um, this is just a little passage at the very beginning. I'll let you read that instead of me reading. So uh, the Sermon on the Mount, we all know fairly well, begins, uh, blessed are the poor, for they shall receive, actually I, I should, I want to be clear, because sometimes I confuse the two. So the Gospel of Luke also has a similar sermon. Blessed are the poor in spirit is the beginning of the one in the Gospel of Matthew. And the Gospel of Luke says, blessed are the poor. Um, and there are variations between what we call the Beatitudes. So the Sermon on the Mount uh, is on a place called the Mount of Beatitudes, this is a Roman Catholic site, a beautiful church that they built here in, in beautiful grounds overlooking uh, the Sea of Galilee there. This has not been an archaeological site, which is understandable, it's just on a mountain. There's nothing to dig up. So they've made it into a very prayerful place here. Um, and that's pretty much it for the, the Mount of the Beatitudes. So the next... The next thing that occurs soon after in the life of Christ is the beheading of St. John the Baptist. And the beheading of St. John um, is uh, one of the, uh, it's in most all of the Gospels, but I'll read the passage in particular from the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark have the most extended description of, of his martyrdom, but all of the Gospel writers talk about John the Baptist being murdered. So this is from the Gospel, Mark chapter 6. And it says, um, Herod himself sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Because John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. His brother was alive. Therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. So you hear Herod even was drawn by the preaching of John the Baptist, and yet he also was angry at John the Baptist for speaking the truth. Then an opportune day came when Herod on his birthday gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers and the chief men of Galilee. And when Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you want, and I will give it to you. He also swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. He must have clearly been intoxicated. <laughs> so he, she went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry because of the oath and because of those who sat with him, i.e. because he feared losing the praise of men. He did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. 
When the disciples heard of it, they came and took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb. It's very tragic. And this uh, martyrdom occurred in a city called Sebastia, or Sebasti. Uh, and so this is the church of the head in Sebastia, because this is where the relic of his head was. So um, the ancient city of Samaria was founded on a strategic hill, and that's the hill that um, this church is at, that Sebastia is now. Um, it was believed to be one of the oldest continuously inhabited places in the West Bank. In the 9th century BC, Samaria served as the capital city of the northern kingdom of Israel until it was destroyed by the Neo-Assyrian Empire around 720 BC. So if you recall um, Samaritans by the time of Christ, they were looked at as non-Jews, even though they followed the first five books of the, the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. Um, but they, it was originally uh, the, the northern kingdom of Israel. And um, when the Assyrians came in, the people there mixed with them, and so their religion became something that the, the undefiled <coughs> Jews saw as not, no longer Jewish, and that's why they looked down on the, on the Samaritans. Uh, um, so Samaria, the kingdom of Samaria, is actually named after the capital city, which is called Samaria. And it became an administrative center under the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians. And during the Roman period, the city was expanded and fortified by Herod the Great, who we just heard in the Gospel, who renamed it Sebastia in honor of Emperor Augustus, because the word Sebasti is Greek for Augustus. So that's where it gets its name. Um, and there are other cities that are also named Sebasti as well. Uh, so this is a site that was recently acquired by Father Justinos, who was the monk at Jacob's Well. We'll get to that site, Jacob's Well, where Christ met the Samaritan woman. But this site, this is the ancient church. It was the church that was built again in the third century or the fourth century. And it's relatively small. The distance from the back to the front is about 50 feet and maybe about the same in width. And then over to the left side here, there's a staircase that goes down to where the relic was. His relic of his head is no longer here. We have the feast days of the finding of his head again and again, but this was the original location of the relic of his head. So this is a view of this hill, strategic hill, looking out over Samaria, which is now Palestine, part of the West Bank. So this is in Palestinian-controlled territory, by the way. Um, and these olive trees here, uh, everywhere is covered with olive trees that they grow. This is the Colosseum that was built by Herod the Great at the time of Christ, around that time, because this was one of the capitals that he used and one of the places that he uh, stayed. These are columns that are there from that time. They've been standing for 2,000 years. Uh, that's more of looking down on the olive leaf orchards. So again, this is the inside of the church. Over there you see someone descending down the stairs. Uh, this is what it looks like, looking down the stairs. Looking down the stairs, and this is inside. So inside, down below, there's the small little altar where you can light candles, a little icon of John the Baptist. Um, and that's inside. Oh, that yeah. <laughs> oh, this is a video of someone walking down inside so you can get a sense of it. Again, amateur video, sorry. <laughs> So very small down in there, and the roof is low. And then there's a little boy asking for money so he can light a candle. So is that similar to like how the early churches were, very small? And well, this, this is the place where his relic was, off to the side of the altar. So uh, I don't know if we're going to get any more of that. Yeah, we will. So I can go back a little ways. Um, so, so that's the inside of the church, and this is the the apse and the altar here, and then to the left side is the place where his relic was. So, but the church design is similar to our churches, where this would be the nave, and then this would be the the sanctuary. Okay, and I think we're at about time. Yeah. Any other questions? 
Okay, yeah, if anyone has questions, that's as much as far as I wanted to get today. So there will be um, two more Sundays of Theology 101, and I'll try to get all the way up until the not including the time of Christ's passion and resurrection. So everything about Jerusalem, about his crucifixion and resurrection, we'll have to wait till the fall. But of his ministry, of his years of ministry, we'll talk about over these next two weeks. Any questions? Yes. Well, this is not in conjunction with your speech um, presentation, but since there's a wedding today, I know that the people are coming at 1.30 um, to use the kitchen so mm -hmm. that even though we have kitchen cleanup groups, we should all help as much yeah, as possible. If anyone can help, that would be great. Yeah, I think they're going to be in there. Yeah, there are several people that are helping set up. Yeah, if there are people helping, if you can, great. Yeah. So when's the next time that we're all invited to go on a church trip? <laughs> <laughs> if you want to start uh, talking around, I would be happy to bring a group someday. So, yeah, it would be a great joy. Um, there's just nothing. It is, it is one of the... I mean, you, you've been. It's one no, of the, I tried to be there. Yeah. Right. Um, it's a whole long story. So, so, so the next time I am um, going to make sure I get there. I'm going to invite them. Oh, to this particular site. So it is uh, a milestone in the course of your entire life to go to the Holy Land. There's nothing like being in the holy places of Christ and of his saints. So I highly encourage that. If people would like to start talking amongst themselves, I'm happy to find a tour guide for us. I know of a guy who's in the Holy Land we could work with. So just let me know. I'm not going to inaugurate that, but if there's enough interest, then we'll, we'll make it work. Okay? Wonderful. God bless you all. Let's close with a prayer. For Christ our God, who for our salvation took on human flesh, became one of us, walked amongst us, taught us, gave us your miracles, and died for us, granting us eternal life through your resurrection. We pray that in this season of the resurrection and of Pascha that you continue to shine the light of your resurrection upon us, that we may be light bearers within this darkened world. For you are a good and loving God, and to you we give glory, to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever, and to the ages of ages. Amen.